thing. Absolutely. You can do it. By the way, when I was growing up, we were taught you you didn't you didn't say anything in church service and worship service, and you didn't clap. You didn't, you didn't even clap in church service. And then I learned out, I learned later on in, in life, and this is not in the Bible, but I learned later on in life that there's actually an entire clapping section in heaven. And it, so, in fact, it's probably an expectation when you get to heaven that you will clap. And then I learned, you know, yeah, as even Baptists can clap. It's okay. It's certainly perfectly on to do that. So, uh, good morning. I'm glad you're here. If you're watching online, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys for being here. And all the way up in the balcony, I can see you back in the corner. Yep, I see you, stay. Jackie, up there. Uh, I'm excited about the day because there was, I was asked a question, and I'm not going to call them out. Uh, I was asked a question weeks ago about something I have been saying on a repetitive basis, and today I'm going to give evidence on why I was saying that over and over and over again. So you gotta, don't, don't get up and leave. At least make it through the sermon, okay? A uh, couple of things I want to share with you. You know we have these little things out there, bulletins. Remember these? Okay, they're there. A lot of great information in there. In fact, if you look today, there's a list of deacons. There's a list of, of several of our uh, prayer needs, as well as some things that are going on, uh, are upcoming. We're trying to communicate better with things that are coming down the pike. For example, if you have one of those and you look at it, children's choir. Children's choir. Yay. Children's choir is going to start March 3rd, Thursdays from 415 to 515. So if you have a child or you want to you encourage your child to be a part of the children's choir, please see Corrine. That's, that's Corrine. Uh, so the, also, if you look, uh, the community night of worship is on the 12th of March at the community center. That's going to be exciting. I want to encourage you to come. Uh, it's not just Salem. There's a lot of churches that are involved. And we'll get to hear from Brent Teague, who's been very instrumental in helping us. We've put, Chuck, what, 15 uh, church buildings? So we've built 15 church buildings uh, with, with this. And it's, it's really a cool opportunity to see and hear about what's going on that. March 13th in the afternoon, uh, they would like for you guys, ladies, all ladies, all ages, to, to come for lunch and learn, uh, to meet, to talk about women's ministry moving forward. So that's March 13th, immediately following the worship service. You're going to get some food, and then there'll be a great time of discussion about the church's women's ministry and how it moves forward and, put, and how that's put together. Uh, I said on the list, there's a board out there that has a lot of prayer requests. We have prayer requests in here. Uh, don't hesitate to take one of the cards and fill that out and give to us. You've gotten really good uh, about us getting those cards, and we appreciate that. And the staff does pray for those on every Tuesday. But today, our focus on prayer to start the service, uh, I'm sure you watch the news. Uh, the Ukraine is one of the largest countries in Eastern Europe. It's also very open to Christianity. And there are a great number of believers in the Ukraine. The Baptist Journal Association of Virginia sent out a request that all of the BGA, BGAV churches spend time in their worship service praying for the churches in Ukraine and for the Ukrainians in particular. And so today we're going to do that along with many, many of our sister churches around the state. And so first we'll start with just a, a moment of silence, clear our heads, and we're going to pray for our brothers and sisters. We think we're persecuted here. They are literally putting their lives on the line and not backing down from what they believe in following Jesus. So if you would, let's spend some time in prayer. Bow with me. Father, there may not be any in this room can fully appreciate and understand what our brothers and sisters are going through. That as Ukraine is attacked, that many of them actually, in the middle of the attack, have spent time just praying together. And God, as, as the rounds fall around them, they're praying. 
Father, we don't truly know what it means to be persecuted for our faith. They are putting their lives where their mouths are. And so, Father, we ask, we ask for their protection. We ask that you would surround them. God, as they gather to pray, that you would listen and hear from heaven and that you would heal their land. So, Father, thank you that you are an ever-present God. Even when the world is crumbling around us, you are there. You guide us. You never leave us or forsake us. And today, as brothers and sisters, we ask you to let that be very real and very evident in the life of the Ukrainian church. God, that they, amid all of this, will show the world what a believer truly holds to and who a believer believes in, and that is you and you alone. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So with that, because they are gathered to pray, they're not able right now to gather to worship. So let's stand today and let's worship on their behalf. Nice and loud. Would you stand as we, as we worship? Amen. We can rejoice this morning because we serve a risen Savior. Amen. Here we go. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Sing it out. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christ. Lift up your voice and sing Eternal hallelujahs To Jesus Christ the King The hope of all who seek Him The help of all who find None other is so loving So good and kind He lives, He lives Christ Jesus lives Today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. He lives, he lives, he lives. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives. 
Amen. Be seated. In fact, let's do something a little bit different. Normally at the end we'll do this, but turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you. There's nothing you can do about it. I'll just let them go for a while. It's all right. <laughs> in Awana, there is a night in, Iwana, in the Awana year called Pump the Pastor. Anybody remember those things? You remember Pump the Pastor nights? No? Um, well, what they would do is they would, ask, they, would, they would ask the pastor to come and stand in front of all the Awana kids. And the Iwana kids could ask whatever question they wanted to. The whole idea was to stump the pastor, uh, pump him for information, stump the pastor, and mess him up. So uh, I had a wonderful Iwana uh, commander. She was great, and she would always give me the questions in advance. I looked brilliant. It, no, that's not cheating. I was just, she would always ask the kids, let's write them down, let's write them down. And then she would give them to me in advance. And so that was really cool. That worked out great. Except this one kid one time asked me a question that I really hadn't prepared for. This kid asked me, how many times does Paul mention the word love in the Bible? Well, off the top of my head, I really couldn't answer that question. I'm like, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, being the nice guy that I was, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go back and I'll research how many times Paul says love or uses the word love in the Bible. And I will come back next week and I will tell you. Now, there are several words for love in the Bible. The one that Paul used the most was the agape or agapeo. I'm sure you heard of the word agape. Raise your Okay. Um, he used the word agape over a hundred times in his letters. In fact, we know others spoke about love too, right? Over 60 times, if you, if you take James, Peter, John, and Jude, there's over 60 times that they talk about agape. Jesus used the word agape 58 times, and that's just the times we have it recorded. So if he's going to use it that many times, and if Paul uses it over 100 times, and then the combined rest of them use it over 60 times, you kind of have to think that they're trying to drive a point home, right? What's important to them? What's important to them? Unconditional love. Because they keep repeating it as though we were going to forget it or something. And then, so they keep repeating it. Uh, but th there was an understanding that all of them have that sometimes we don't have. And that is this, that unconditional, godly love, agape love, will always, now mark my word, always manifest itself in real action. Agape love isn't an emotion. It is a choice. And it will always manifest itself in our actions. Now, as we continue with Peter in this whole life as an alien, in 1 Peter, he talks about just how important that love is in and for the church. How vital is it for us? Look in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read 22 through 25. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. I'll give you a second to get there with me. You should already have your bookmark there, right? Yes? No? Okay. Sylvia, thank you. Um, verse 22, 1 Peter chapter 1. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever and this is the word which was preached to you he says since you are who you are since you have in obedience followed jesus and purified your soul by by him since you are that being and since you are going to be obedient see there's a, an understanding says since all this happens 
I know that you're going to obey. Peter's giving him a lot of credit, isn't he? You say you're a follower of Jesus, so that means I know automatically that you are going to obey what he has taught and what we're supposed to be doing. And since that is true, and since your, your spirit, your soul has been purified by the Holy Spirit, since that is the case, you need to have a sincere love of the brethren and a fervent love for one another from the heart. Can we just be real honest with each other up front? Sometimes people are hard to love. There's a lot of head nodding on that green. They're like, yep, yeah, exactly. In fact, there's a lot of folks that make it hard to love them. It's almost as if they're trying, right? Okay. What I find interesting, and this is the answer to the question I was given several weeks ago, if, if you study it deeper, you find out Peter actually uses two different words for love. In verse 22, he uses two different words. He, but have you wondered why? If you read it, why does he say love of the brethren and then a fervent love? It's actually two different kinds of love. The first one is Philadelphian. Now, we know what Philadelphia means, right? The city of brotherly love, unless you've been there recently. But for them, phila, or Philadelphia, or Philadelphian, Philadelphian being the type of love, was a brotherly kind of love. And then the second word for love that he uses is the word agape. Now, let's talk about that for a second. The, the word Philadelphian meaning brotherly love, the love of a friend, and agape, or agapeo, being unconditional, no strings attached. And by the way, you know why this kind of love is alien to the world? Because they love with strings attached. I will love you if you do, or as long as you do, what I want you to do. I will love you as long as it benefits me. Okay? So, he uses this term phila. Now, the word phila, or Philadelphian, is, means to be absolutely sincere in your affection for your fellow believer. Let me say that again. It means to be sincere with an affection to your fellow believer. Turn to your left and turn to your right and realize that you have to be affectionate to that individual appropriately. <laughs> Don't be holding hands with somebody else's wife, okay? That's not what that means. <laughs> But I went a bit further in studying this word. If you look in Webster's Dictionary under the word affection, the word affection, you ready for this? A feeling of liking someone. So when I say to you, the Bible tells you you are not only supposed to love people, you're supposed to like them. As fun as that's going to be, and as hard as that will be at times, that is why Peter uses two different words. It encompasses everything we are. I love you unconditionally, but I also have an affection for you, which means that I like you. It got real quiet, guys. Did you notice that? Because <laughs> let's be honest, again, people will often make it hard to love them, won't they? But they tend to be really good at making you not like them. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more, okay? You recall me saying that again, and I know what you're thinking. But what if I don't like what they're doing? Do you notice here that Peter never says that you have to like their behavior? He doesn't say you have to like their actions. He says, but you have to like them. You have to have this brotherly affection for them. You can love someone and you can like someone and still not be happy with what they are doing. And in fact, if you were a true brother and sister in Christ, you will lovingly walk up next to them and be gentle like you like them and say, let's not do this anymore. Right? I can still love you and like you. But then if that's the case, I need to then help you in the things that are happening that are not godly. And you know what? That is entirely alien 
to our world today. In the world today, love is an emotion. Love has nothing to do with uh, with, with being unconditional. And uh, even liking people, even it happens in the church, we'll like someone provided we're getting something out of it. Correct? That's what happens. Peter says, look, you cannot be a hypocrite in this. Now, you all know where the word hypocrite comes from. It's actually a Greek word. Hypocrite is a Greek word that means play acting. How many of you have ever seen these pictures for um, theater groups? And there's two different masks, right? One is a happy mask and one is a frowning mask. You've seen those before? Okay. First of all, there's two different personalities on the mask. Second of all, you know what they still are? Masks. And that's what we do. Peter says, look, don't do that. Do not put on a mask that has a smiley face on it so that people think you're, you like them, only to walk around and then put on another mask that's frowning because you don't like them. In fact, that's where we connect the word. You ever, you ever had anybody, you've ever met anybody and said, that person is two-faced. You've heard that? That comes from the word hypocrite. It comes from that whole thing with theater being a play actor. And and Peter says, don't do that. That can't be you. Because fake love, and we all know this, guys, come on. Fake love breeds distrust. Because how many of you, how long does it take for you, if someone says they love you and their actions speak differently, how long does it take you to figure that out? Not long at all. Not long at all. And what happens? You, you stop trusting them, don't you? It also creates disunity. Fake love creates disunity because, number one, nobody's trusting anybody anymore. And so we're all going to go out and just do our own thing. And instead, he says, you have to have this Philadelphian love for your brothers and sisters, your church family. And it is to be sincere and it is to be without hypocrisy. And there are reasons for it. First and foremost, because God, through Jesus, loved you when you were unlovable. The other things we'll touch on here in a minute. He, he goes on with this word agapeo, which means this uh, unconditional love, and it is supposed to be fervent. The, if you know what the word fervent means, that means basically set on fire. Set on fire. Now think about this, guys. If we unconditionally love each other, and it's fervent, that is, with a fire, with a passionate fire of, of unconditional love, people in this community will come here just to warm themselves. You follow me? Think about it this way. When you join a local church body, it's like stating your wedding vows from this day forward for better or for worse. You've been a part of a church where you've had both better and worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish till death do us part. You know when you join the body of Christ, that's what you're saying. Better or worse. (laughs) We got money, we don't have money. When we're sick, when we're healthy. That's the love that we are commanded to have for each other. That's the love that Peter is talking about. And in fact, it's supposed to be real, genuine. God says in in 1 John, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother or sister. Now watch. How many of you know this, this scripture? 1 John 4, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. Let that one sink in for just a moment. You can fake love, but you can't fake it very long until it reveals itself. Our behavior, our attitude, 
will betray us. Think about this. I mean, if you say that you love your church, if you say that you love your church family, and then lie to them, mislead them, or speak ill of them, that means gossip, then your love is not real. If you say that you love your church family and then treat them like, like they have a disease, it's not genuine. He says it's got to be genuine. And it's got to be unconditional. How many of you have children? How many of you have older children? How many of you know that no matter how old they get, they're still going to make mistakes? <laughs> Some of those kids are actually sitting in this room going, Mama, put your hand down. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't do that. We know that kids make mistakes, don't they? Sometimes they make really big mistakes, don't they? Up and down is yes. That's the only answer you got, okay? You can't say no. You have, up and down is all you got. When they make those big mistakes, do you cast them out? Do you beat them up? No. You help them. Do you stop loving them? Over the years, you're going to hear me talk about my brother. My brother spent time in federal prison because he was selling more drugs than four or five humans could consume. And all you do, you just pick a, pick a drug. It didn't matter. He sold it. Now, he was the dumb one. He also took it. Now, you're saying, that's not nice to say about your brother. I love my brother. I absolutely love my brother. He has made some horrible mistakes. And while I've never been happy about those choices he made, and by the way, he's been clean for eight years. And, and so has his wife. And if we thank God for her because she's bigger than him and she will beat him up. <laughs> and my sister and I gave her permission. But I never stopped loving him. I was devastated by what he did. Our mother was devastated by him going to federal prison. But we never stopped loving him. And when he got his act together, my sister and I were right there at the bus station at 4 o'clock in the morning. Deb was with us when he pulled into the bus station got in, getting out of federal prison and we hugged him and said, okay, are you ready to move on? We're going to have church members that do some really dumb stuff sometimes. If we love them, if we like them, we'll help them unconditionally. Sometimes it won't be easy, but if you care about them, won't you take some sort of action to help them? Unconditional does not mean that you turn a blind eye to the problem, but that you are truthful and kind in dealing with it. You deal with the mistake. You deal with the problems in a spirit of compassion in order to restore, not destroy. And let me tell you something. This, what he talks about in 1 Peter... This kind of love, this kind of liking, folks, yeah, you better have the Holy Spirit. That's what better be fueling this thing. Because let's be honest, again, some people are just hard to love, right? And in fact, you're happy with yourself if you didn't slap them. <laughs> but it, at least there's that. You know, at least, at least I didn't have to punch them in the throat. And you pat yourself on the back. I really do love you. Why? Because I didn't have to slap you. When I wanted to. People are just like that. They will rub you the wrong way sometimes. That's why loving people like this, liking people in a Philadelphian type of affection, is so foreign to the world. It doesn't make any sense. Loving people can be hard. Liking them can be a stretch some days. But have you ever noticed... In Galatians, when it lists the fruit of the Holy Spirit, what is the number one thing on the list in the gifts or the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love. It's the very first thing in the fruit of the Spirit. The very first thing it says is love. Unconditional love. And if you are a follower, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, and a follower of Jesus Christ, you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So what should manifest itself in your life? Love. Because we're not capable of it on our own. Without God's Spirit, His command to love one another would be, quite frankly, unreasonable. 
We do not have it within us to do it unless you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Then you have all that you need within you to love and to like your brothers and sisters in Christ because he is now living in us. He has awakened our mind and our soul and spirit to God's love and it able, enables us to love him and enables us to love each other, even those who are difficult to love. To love even those who it seems as if they're actually trying to make it so that you can't love them. So without this thing being spirit-fueled, it's not going to work. And this kind of love, let's be honest, it's real selfless. It's not manipulative. It, 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 only to appear loving and thinking that you can get something out of the other person as long as you do, that's not biblical love. Biblical love is selfless. It's a love for the church that says, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Where can I serve you? It, it's the sincere, fervent love that puts others first. Again, we are, by nature, as humans, inherently selfish. Have you ever had to teach a kindergartner to be selfish? What do we always have to teach kindergartners? How to share. Why? Because we are inherently selfish. That's human nature. You ever notice you never have to teach a five-year-old how to lie either? They come by it naturally. That's why being truthful and honest and loving is actually foreign and alien to this world. This alien love is a choice. This unconditional love is exercised by your will, not your emotion. In fact, it will love in spite of your current emotion. Emotions, you guys know, emotions change like the wind, don't they? You'd be happy right now. You'll get in a car, somebody's going to say something to you, and all of a sudden you're mad. mad. Emotions change as the wind blows. Love, however, this kind of love makes a choice to love consistently, consistently no matter what the emotion is. And just like the obedience Peter mentions that they had followed, he said, you choose to obey this and follow this. To choose to do otherwise is direct disobedience to the word of God. And it has to be action, active. There has to be some action in it. You can tell somebody you love them a thousand times a day, but one action will speak louder than those thousand words. Amen? I've seen it happen in, in, in relationships. One, where one individual is just really, really abusive and then falls out, oh, but I love you, don't leave. Only to turn around and be abusive again. No, if you love me, you would stop hitting me. The emotion of love is actually a good thing. I would tell, I tell couples that are getting married, you know, the, the, the emotional part of love, y'all need to enjoy that. Have fun with it. But this isn't about emotion. The Bible speaks of it being alive and manifested in tangible ways. I'll give a quick example, uh, real quick. So, ladies, I need your help. What would be more impactful to you, ladies, my sisters? If your husband on Valentine's brought you two dozen red roses, and said, Happy Valentine's Day. Or, if they came home on a random Wednesday with a single rose and said, Hey, baby, I love you. Which one matters more, the first one or the second one? Men, pay attention. Quit buying all them roses. <laughs> don't, it's, don't go out and buy two dozen roses. She just told you one will suffice. If you think about it, though, that's true because one, the one is a random act that occurred for no reason other than what? 
you love you. I love you, and, and I thought about you. It's the same thing, guys. We can say all day that we love our church. We can have a fila kind of love for our brothers and sisters without having an agapeo, but we cannot have unconditional love and not like our brothers and sisters with a brotherly love. When you and I have an unconditional brotherly love for our church family, it appears in how we live in harmony and unity. And it becomes very vital for the church, guys. Because these two things together look so uniquely unlike the world. Liking each other, having an affection for each other, having an unconditional love looks so uniquely different. In fact, was it not Jesus who said, they will know you are my followers by your doctrine? What did he say? They will know you are my followers by your love. It was what was so attractive in Acts chapter 2. They saw this weird group of people all of a sudden loving God, worship, praising, studying, and liking on each other. And it says, the, and the Bible says that the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Can you imagine a day where we have the, a, a, a trough out here every day and at noon we're baptizing people? Every day. Yeah, right? We would be in the newspapers as a revival. It would be amazing. The greatest testimony of our witness that we will ever have is loving our brothers and sisters in Christ and striving along each, with each other. Because it's so... Form How many... Well, don't raise your hand on that. I was going to ask a bad question. I probably don't hit... For example, let me put it this way. If you have a dysfunctional family... Now, my sister and I joke all the time that our family put the fun in dysfunctional. Okay? <laughs> If you have a dysfunctional family and you look inside the church doors and you see dysfunction, you're not going back, are you? Like, I got enough dysfunction in my life. I don't need to add to it. I got enough drama in my family. I don't need drama in the church. And they won't come back. And they can feel it, too. You ever walk into a room and you could, you could cut the tension with a knife? You know what I'm talking about? Do you ever go back? Like, I don't want to be around these people. I do not want to be around these people. They don't like each other. They're not going to like me. Can you imagine in our testimony, though, if someone walks in and says, you know what? I took two things away from that service today. Number one, man, do they love God. Wow, do they love each other. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to come back because they don't have that in everyday life. It produces unity. unity. Unity does not bring love. Love brings unity. Colossians 2, 2 says that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love. How many remember the name Vince Lombardi? Coach Vince Lombardi. If you're under the age of 40, Google it. <laughs> he was asked a question one time. He said, how is it that your team is so effectual on the field? How, how is it that you're able to perform so well? This was his answer to the reporter. He said, you know, there are a lot of coaches with good ball clubs who know the fundamentals and have plenty of discipline, but still don't win the game. He said, but then there is a third ingredient besides the fundamentals and the discipline. He says, if you're going to play together as a team, you have to care for one another. You've got to love each other. Now, this is Vince Labardi, a football coach. You've got to care for one another. You have to love each other each other. He said, each player has to be thinking about the next guy and saying to himself, if I don't block that man, Paul is going to have his legs broken. Where the player says, I have to do my job well in order that he can do his job well. 
And he went on to say the difference between mediocrity and greatness is the feeling these guys have for each other. If a football coach and a bunch of hairy athletes can figure it out, how much more should we? Colossians 3.14 says, Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Guys, this alien love testifies to the world. What greater testimony can we have to the, to the world than to love God and love each other? And to like each other. How many of you know it's easy to tell some church people in a restaurant on Sundays? It's actually easy to tell. Church people in a restaurant on Sundays. They'll be the ones complaining about someone or something concerning a worship service. It's true. I got an example. And I'm going to name names. Everybody out there is now very nervous. <laughs> And the people watching online saying, thank goodness I'm not there. <laughs> it's, it's kind of embarrassing, to be honest with you. We had, Deb and I had gone to church with her mother and father. Uh, and like good Baptists, when the service was over, we went to the buffet. <laughs> we did. Okay, she's shaking her head. She's probably, I'm, I am in so much trouble right now. Uh, <laughs> Can I get a ride home? Uh, we hadn't been at the buffet very long. And again, like good Baptists, we took all, all at one time so that we would leave the rest for others. Because if you go back and get seconds, that's gluttony. If I get it all at once, it's not gluttony. So we get the buffet. We sit down. We're eating. And her father just goes off in this tirade telling us about this person and that person or this person. It didn't like, didn't like this person, didn't like that person. And he just went on and on and on. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, and by the way, it, he wasn't whispering. He wasn't like, did you see so-and-so come in? Let me tell you what they did last week. No, it wasn't. No, it was broadcast. Booming voice. And, and you could hear it no matter where you were in the restaurant. I'm thinking to myself, if anybody asks where we go to church, I'm going to make up a name. <laughs> I'm going to tell them it's in downtown Atlanta, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them it's Charles Stanley. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, because I don't want them knowing, because this is bad. Uh, because if you tell them where you actually went to church, there's a chance are they'll never ever be in that church. They won't go there because all they've ever heard is somebody complain and gripe and moan about this person and that person in their church. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, we're not talking about a problem that might exist that has to be dealt with. We're talking about still having to love and like them in the midst of the problem. And you can do that and still have consequences. You can, you can do that and still address a problem. What would you, if you're out somewhere and you overhear a conversation about a church and it's just negative, you're not going to want to go there, are you? On the flip side, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And guys, because of that, the, this alien love becomes so attractional. Again, most families have some level of dysfunction. Some have outright family feuds. And if that person looks in the church and sees dysfunction as well, if they see warring among the tribes, why would they want to be a part of it? In Acts 2, again, it was impactful because they had a unity that was produced by the love. It was fueled by the Holy Spirit. And people saw something in that group that they had not seen in real life. A strange people. 
living what they believed, loving and caring for one another. And those people wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to know, what do you have? How is it that you can love each other like this? Because this doesn't make any sense. When the church is the church God has called it to be, when we express the love and the light, you know what happens? You can't stop it from growing. If the church body is loving their brothers and sisters and liking their brothers and sisters, you cannot stop it from growing. Again, because it's fervent. And what does fervent mean? It's on fire. And I'm not saying we, we, we got to always get it right. <laughs> Once you involve humans, we tend to mess things up. Amen? The world knows we're not always going to get it right. That's not the issue. The issue is how do we get through it together? Does the sincerity of our love, the fire of the unconditional love, help us to overcome those things? The writer in Proverbs chapter 10 wrote this. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. Most of the things we get upset about that derail the love aren't really all that important. But the love he commands for us to have for one another should never die, even in the most difficult of times. Even when you have to deal with bad situations, there should still, it should still be done with an attitude of love and a heart of love. So the challenge for us is go, leave here, be sincere, be fervent, be alien, and watch what it does to the world. In a second, I'm just going to ask you to stand if you would. Go ahead and stand now if you would, and we're going to sing. But here's, here's what I'm going to throw out to you. Yes, if you want to come join Salem Baptist Church, please do. We would love to have you. Both love and like to have you. Maybe, maybe today there's a situation. Doesn't that necessarily have to be in the church? It could be a situation in your own home, in your workplace. Maybe that person you're working with says they go to church and they're a believer, and you're like, I don't like you. And guess what? They're still your brother and sister, and they're still part part of the greater church. So maybe you want to come down to her today to the front and just pray and say, God. I'm struggling with this one. Help me to love them. Help me to deal with it. Help me to, to get to know them. Maybe you know that there's somebody that has a problem with you. Maybe you want to come down and say, God, I, I, I want to get it right with them, so help me to address it with love. Help me, and, and God, I pray that you would, that they would express that same love to me. Or maybe you're an individual in right here today, and this whole unconditional love thing, you have absolutely no clue what we're talking about because it's so different, so foreign, so alien to you. I will promise you that absent of the, the presence of Jesus Christ in your life and the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you will never be able to love anybody the way God has called you to love. Amen. But what about this? What if you've never felt love? Truly never unconditional love. It's always had strings attached. And you're like, I don't, I don't, I don't know that anybody loves me that way. Well, I'm going to tell you something. There's a God who loves you unconditionally, who sent his son to die for you so that you too could have that unconditional love for him and for others. He said, if you'll just confess, God, I can't do this. I've messed up in my life. I've, th these sins, you know, it's like, it, it's just like, it's just overwhelming. And, and I'm, and I'm done. I'm so done with this. Father, come, come into my life. I confess these things to you. I'm gonna, I want you to turn my life around and I will follow you. 
He says, if you'll do that, he will bring you into this family. He will forgive you, show you grace and mercy. And he'll put you in a church family that will love on you. Now, notice I didn't say a perfect church family. He'll put you in a family that will love on you. So whatever you need to come down today, I want to encourage you. Don't hesitate. Don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Nobody's going to think bad of you. We're just going to love on you. Would you bow with me? Father God, thank you. The very thing that we are not capable of, you equip us to do. God, it's hard to fathom in our mind that we have to have unconditional love as well as an affection for our brothers and sisters. We admit that it's hard, oftentimes harder than we could ever imagine. And so God, help us. Let that fruit of the Spirit, that very fruit, first fruit of the Spirit, let it manifest itself in our lives. And God, as we show the world what it looks like, as foreign and as strange and as alien as it is, it will draw them to you because it all comes from your love to begin with. Won't you come as we sing? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've heard thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I never a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never Thanks for coming and worship today. Guys, if you're online, the live stream, thank you for joining us today. Let's get out there and let's love on our church family. And let's, let's love on the world. Let's show them what's alien in this place. And as always, God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you equip us. You fill us. God, to know that the things that you command of us and the things that you challenge us to do, while we are not capable in of ourselves to do it, to know that you are and that you indwell in each one of us. Not that the world would see us, but they would see you in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.